the specials and selector. Oh, and that. Okay. Now, and, and, yeah. and body snatchers. Yeah. yeah. And, and the actual, the audience, there was a huge fight just down at Bristol, down at uh, what was the old Locarno. And there was a massive fight, and, and they stopped it and said, We're not playing until this mm. stops. And there was a lot of violence in the audiences yeah. at that time. Well, you and get that a was lot quite scary. Factions, political factions. But, yeah, you? there was a lot of that, and it, and it really highlighted a lot of the race issues. And because mm. I was from Bristol anyway, there's an awful lot of that that was involved yeah. in the music. Statements, so it would be bands like uh, The Associates. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. The Associates, Billy what McKenzie, an amazing voice. Who I saw yeah. three or four times. Yeah. Brilliant. Sadly, ended his life. Yeah, mm, probably ten years ago. Yeah, uh, Gang of Four. Yeah, um, Gang of Four. Oh, Throbbing Gristle. Throbbing Gristle. Not so much. A bit too industrial. Mm. Uh, they used to read a lot of music papers. Oh yeah, enemy reader yeah. mainly. Yeah, yeah. 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 very much. Well, um, Julie Burchill came from yeah. Bristol, right. and yeah. uh, she went to London at the same about the same time as me yeah. actually. And I used to read, love reading that. Yeah. Again, it was very liter. It was very literate. Very it wasn't literate, like the comic yeah. sort of. Journalism you get now. Yeah. Now, have you read Enemy recently? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not it's nowhere near the same, is it? it takes no, about it's three seconds. Winding all the way through. It's, it's, yeah. it's just. But yeah. you haven't got any reflective comment or yeah, anything. Nothing. I mean, it's as if like you think, well, because you're musical or because you're writing for a music paper, you're thick. Mm. And actually, quite the opposite yeah. is true. I mean, well, I had a, I had a few music lessons, but pretty much self-taught, to be honest. Um, and I, I've got a very good ear, so I just really can just go with it. And I've, after a while, I. I I've never been that interested in emulating or trying to work out other people's material. I can do it, but I've never really thought, yeah, I want to get on top of that, and if I learn how to do that, then that'll make me a better player. I just do what I do, and, and that's it, you know, and I've always felt that way. I think when you start to emulate uh, people, it's interesting, because when I was in Bristol, and there's a lot of jazz musicians that I knew mm. trying to emulate people like Charlie Parker yeah. and playing a solos note for note, which is a similar thing. And, and all the time you're trying to be like somebody else. And I think that as a, as a singer or, or a guitar player, you, you find your <coughs> own voice mm -hmm. and then you play what you want to do. And that's the authenticity of anybody. Yeah. But you, if you're trying to do covers, if you're going to do something, you've got to do it differently. You can't do it the same. I mean, I think, yeah, then it went into more of a, a jazz funk thing. They were great. And we Amazing. did a lot of gigs on in the American Air Force bases in Germany. We go over like six months at a time. So uh, you knew each other at this point? No. no, no, no. no. Uh, when you said you knew about the band, I thought you might have. Oh no, only in hindsight, oh, right, only showed right, me, so and I've heard tapes, right, old yeah, tapes, they were yeah. amazing. Very tight band. Very tight, Very sort of a real, real hot funk, um, jazzy kind of band. Uh, and they went for quite a few years touring, did loads and loads of gigs, never recorded as such. And then after that... Uh, Is that something you regret? Um, yeah, it was just saying that we never really thought about much of the time. It was just like let's go out there and, and, and work, basically. And I think at that time, you know, you you could get loads and loads of work, and you just go out for months at a time. You made a living, didn't you? You, you could a make a living from out of it. Yeah, make a living from it. And then I came back, got a bit fed up with that, um, and then I well I helped form a band called from that a band called Uncle Poe. Uh, which was a kind of then a real kind of a mixture of kind of jazz, rock, weird, psychedelic, um, and then go, and then going into new wave as well territory as well. And uh, we literally rehearsed our asses off. We none of us worked. Uh, we'd rehearse literally every day, and we were really really tight. We just go out and play these gigs and we took loads of drugs and we would be, I can't even imagine doing it now, be completely off our heads but would still be absolutely really tight, amazing, simply because we, we did so much. That's because of the discipline. Though. Yeah, <laughs> well it was the discipline, you just got them to do it and then yeah we had a single out um, and that didn't really do anything and then it kind of, the band just kind of fell apart and then this was kind of in the new wave era, era and then the band called The Fans I was in where we, um, again we had uh, we had uh, two two records out and some tracks on that. This was on a, have you got those records? I have, yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, um, interestingly, I guess it's a connection even though I'm spinning right off into, the, into almost now, that band was very, very popular, did loads of gigs and then we split up uh, and then I had a contact from a guy in Bristol who said this uh, Japanese record company in Tokyo really love new wave stuff they want to put your records out um, and uh, one of the, a top Japanese rock band called Brahman has picked up one of your songs 
and it's on their album, and it's doing amazingly well. We want you to come over and Please talk. Please tell me you've got that as well. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. that's yeah. 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 You're making me happy now. Yeah, I can, I can show you all that stuff. I hate records going astray. No, no. <laughs> so, yeah, two years ago, the band reformed to tour Japan, and we went over for about two weeks, and then we got stuck over there because it was the time when the volcano went up, and there were no planes <laughs> back, so we were stuck in Tokyo. It was a real shame. Uh, oh, a band called The Tropics, who were very quite political. Um, had a, uh, a manager who was Jeff Beck's manager, thought things were going to happen. It might have destroyed my life. <laughs> Didn't happen. Uh, split up, um, and then worked with some other guys. Did a lot more. I was doing a lot of session work at the time as well. Um, a band then I was in was called Tropical Hearts. And Peter Gabriel's team picked us up. Uh, Georgia Cogney, who was uh, one of the producers on So, picked us up. We went up to Paris, did a lot of recording. He ripped us off. <laughs> uh, George. <laughs> and then that's when I got into the multimedia stuff, which formed this, uh, this group called the, the Skull Academy, which was a group of musicians and actors and performance people and visual. And we put on a couple of shows in Bristol which we usually run for a week, usually at maybe at University Theatre or whatever, it cost loads of money to put on. And the biggest one was called The Shroud of Kronos, which was filmed. A friend of mine who's got a digital um, recording um, system or a business in Munich compiled it all for me recently, put it on, digitised it all for me, which is great. I eventually might get it up onto somewhere for someone to see it. That is really weird. I think it was about a two hour show in all. Uh, and then, then met Karen then in the early 90s, and in fact, even at that time, uh, we started, it, we started, it was all working on kind of um, quite alternative experimental stuff, and then Karen was doing kind of voicings, and there was a lot of dance and movement, and you were in one of the Skull Academy shows, weren't you? The Ed Allen, we did this thing yeah, around, yeah. a couple of Ed Allen stories. Um, the Mask of the Red Death, uh, you know, did some really hellish music for that. Um, and then we were kind of play together, and then we really started working together probably around oh, late 90s and started to do some work then. And that's when we kind of met, really, wasn't it? And kind of, you know, became a little bit more than a working partnership. I'll go into Karen's story in a minute, but I want, I want to cut back to something. Yeah. Uh, the, the ripping off bit. That's yeah. if, if you've got new musicians and it's mm. going to be local musicians, yeah. what, what does. The ripping off bit looked like. What 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 do they tell you that <laughs> entices you in, and then what are the mistakes to look out for? Well, if you could go back again, look at the small print for starters. Look at because it's so it, you know you just can't be bothered. Oh yeah, it'll be all right. I, you know, fine. Look out for the guy who is really so friendly and smiley and wants to you to be his friend and take you everywhere and take you out to dinner. And we'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll pay for this, and then suddenly you realise they're not going to, or they might disappear with your demo because they say they own it, and then suddenly realise you haven't signed anything to actually say that you actually, you know, you have the copyright. It's so easy to for, to um, <coughs> ignore the minutiae, and it's so easy to get lost within all that. And it's very complicated too. And is it the fear of losing the deal if they even question it? Is that part of it? As well? That is part of it. Yeah, you got you know if, if you yeah you want to be nice and this guy's been really nice to you, and if you're all up front and bullshit, well, they might just take a piss off and go, well, we'll go to the next band. You know, um, it's so difficult, and I think that probably still goes on now. Although I, I do know a lot of younger musicians who are really sassed, like, you know. But I think it still happens. Watch out for the man with the smile. <laughs> uh, I started from the back foot because I didn't have as much confidence. And I was with a band that was quite, I suppose it was an, uh, an 80s power pop thing. And it was original music. And it was, he was a very good singer, actually, the guy. And I got into the backing uh, singing. And, how, and how did that happen? Did they just come and ask you, or had they seen you? Or I'm you trying to think how I got into that. I think I met somebody via the pub, because I was a very, very heavy drinker, and I always met everybody in the pub. Um, so it would have been through that, and I think somebody said, oh, why don't you come along and just have a go? And I was absolutely terrified, mm. absolutely terrified. And I went in, and as soon as I got in front of the microphone, I just thought, I actually know I'm good at this. But I, I didn't, I, I, I held back a lot. 
and this happened for quite for quite a while. And then, I, as I got more and more confident, I was in a band, and the, the lead singer, it's called the Flying Carpets, the band was. Ah, oh, terrible name, but I mean, it was it was actually quite a good band. There's been worse. There's been a lot worse than that, I'll tell you. And and the singer, he he couldn't sing. Actually, I hope. He, oh God, if he ever watches, but he couldn't. <laughs> crap. And we kicked him out. And I said, well, I'll sing. And, and I, I took over and I suddenly realised, yeah, this is where I should be, at the front, because I've got a, the voice for it and I've got the, I want to do this. So I, I did that. And then I was in, um, that folded and I got involved in a lot of voice work, a lot of voice vocal dynamic work and um, things like Mon Mongolian overtone chanting, um, singing from the gut, really finding your voice. And once you find that voice, you, it never goes because it's like the authentic belly voice and a lot of women they speak and they sing right up here and there's only oh, nee, nee, nee. and I was never like that so I used to think I was weird until I discovered that actually that's that's really the voice I've got and it's a bloody fantastic voice and you need that voice if you're going to project so I also got involved with something called the Albert Eiler project which Albert Eiler was a jazz musician from the 60s fantastic player but very alternative sort of music not everyone's cup of tea but some of the vocal stuff was great his partner um, she had the most amazing voice and I, I, I did that tour with them we did a, a sort of a tour around um, when used to get funding Southwest funding <laughs> Southwest <laughs> Arts we went to London uh, we went to all oh, different places and it was just a great experience and it was all it was, it was what I suppose you'd say avant-garde whatever that means mm. but it was it was a truthful authentic bunch of people and it was great i really enjoyed it and then came back to to bristol and in the early 90s i sort of met up with rob and and, and again I, I was the backing singer to start with in a band that we were in called the altar boys That's i right. was a girl i said we got to change the name you were a girl that was old we got to yeah. change the name please um and i and again the singer left a, a very good singer called john kelly he was a fantastic guy but he he didn't want to do it anymore and i said well i'll do it so i took over and at the time i was playing sax as well uh, in the band alto sax wild sax wild player. sax screaming sax <laughs> because we worked together a long time we got a vast catalogue of materials just you know still working on it really but yeah we're pretty much up to date yeah. so